Hello everyone, welcome to History of Israel 101, a podcast about Israeli history for those already somewhat familiar with it. My name is Yegor Skrisbergs and today, in keeping with the precedent established by our previous podcast, we will again talk about history of ancient Israel. Uh, specifically, we will discuss the conquest of the land of Canaan by Israelites. Uh, our esteemed guest today is Professor Sean Zeligaster, a senior lecturer at Martin Schuss Department of Land of Israel Studies and Archaeology and the Department of Hebrew Bible at bar -Ilan University. Uh, Professor Aster, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, before we go into the meat of the discussion, could you possibly tell our viewers a little bit about yourself and your research interests? Okay, my name is Sean Zelig Aster. I teach biblical history and geography here at bar -Ilan. Uh, I My research interests began with the history of the Hebrew Bible and realized that to do the history you have to do the geography of the Hebrew Bible and you have to do the archaeology of the Hebrew Bible and so these are areas that I find most interesting in which I uh, teach. Uh, I published a lot on the history of the interactions between the Assyrians and Israel which is a somewhat later topic but today I understand we're speaking about the period of the conquest, the early is what's called in uh, scholarly parlance early Israel. So uh, let's go ahead. Yes, thank you very much sir. Uh, so, as our viewers probably know, the uh, conquest of the land, uh, land of Canaan uh, by Israelites is described in the book of Joshua. And there it says that the God gave this land to Israelites and that they were commanded to destroy uh, the Canaanites who inhabited this land. Uh, could you possibly tell us in a bit more detail what exactly does the book of Joshua tell us about it? Right. So, it's important to understand that the book of Joshua is a con is, uh, contains various parts to it. The first five chapters of Joshua are essentially a narrative about the figure of Joshua and how the figure of Joshua can do in many ways better than what Moses could do. The, Israel, the book of Joshua begins with a crisis. It's after the death of Moses. Moses was the man who spoke to God face to face. There is no other person like, like Moses. That's what we're told at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. How can the Israelites go on without such a person? The book of Joshua comes and tells us that Joshua was able to be as successful as Moses. Joshua sends, Moses sent spies to Canaan, Joshua sent spies to Canaan. But Joshua's spies are more successful than Moses. Moses split the Red Sea, but Joshua splits the, split, split the Jordan. Moses leads the people, but Joshua leads the people without any revolts. And so the first five chapters of Joshua are about the figure of Joshua as a successor to Moses and the possibility of going on after Moses. Then we get into the next group of chapters, which is essentially chapters 6 to 11. Chapters 6 to 11 of Joshua are the wars of Joshua. And here is the most famous part of the book, the most dramatic part of the book of all these wars. The Israelites stampede over the land and conquer, except when we actually read the stories, we see that the Israelites don't stampede all over the land and don't conquer everywhere. There are all in all four wars, two of which are fairly minor affairs. One is the city of Jericho, one is the city of Ai, and then the two larger wars, one in the south and one in the north. Nevertheless, in chapter 13, we're told much of the land remains unconquered. So there is clearly no complete conquest of the land in Joshua. And it's important to recognize that. Uh, there are certain conquests under Joshua, narrated in chapter 6 to, 13, 6 to 11, but there is no complete conquest of the land. Then we move into chapters 14 and 15 and following, where we're told for several ch uh, chapters up till chapter 20, the division of the land among the different tribes. And this is recognized as a uh, product, not only of the period of Joshua, but also of somewhat later periods in the First Temple period. And then the book concludes with uh, four chapters discussing the ways in which Joshua speaks to the Israelites before his death and how he creates a, or attempts to create, a unique Israelite identity. So the book of Joshua is not primarily a book of conquest. There is a story of conquest for five or six chapters in it, but it's not completely a book of conquest. Within those chapters of conquest, there are two small wars and two larger wars. For the two larger wars, we have the story of the conquest of Hazor or Hazar in the north. There we find an archaeological, very interesting destruction level from the 13th century, indicating that Hazor was burnt in the 13th century. One can, of course, discuss whether or not the Israelites effected that. And then for the, the second large war in chapter 11, we have a, uh, a sorry, this, this, the first large war in chapter 10, we have a discussion of the wars in the south, and that's a, a separate topic.
um, is there any evidence uh, to, to this account presented outside of the Bible? Okay, so that's an important and, and relevant uh, question. Uh, the most compelling archaeological evidence for Israelite settlement is not that of conquest and destruction, but rather for the small settlements that we find emerging in the hills of Samaria in the 13th century, BCE, of course, and then continuing in the 12th century, uh, which begin as very, very small settlements and gradually, gradually expand into somewhat larger settlements and fill the area in the 13th and 12th centuries. Again, this is in the hills of Samaria from approximately the region of north of Bethel, going north all the way to the Jezreel Valley. The hills, which were empty in the preceding period, begin to fill up with uh, settlements. At around the same time, in 1209 BCE, we find the Egyptian king Merneftah, who in a very famous inscription describes how he conquers the cities of Ashkelon and Gezer, and then moves on to Yenoam, which is in the northeast of the Jordan. And along the way, he describes how he destroys the people of Israel. The people of Israel there are described as a Semitic-speaking people, using Egyptian determinative. Uh, they inhabit the region somewhere between Gezer and Yenoam, in other words, in the hills of Samaria. And so there's a very close correspondence between the people that Merneftach describes, again in 1209 BCE, and the archaeology of the settlement in the hills of Samaria between the, in the 13th, 12th centuries, continuing on into the 11th and 10th. Those, the hills of Samaria continued to be settled by this group all the way down into the end of the Iron II, in other words, down to the 8th century. Uh, and these are it's very clear that by later periods they call themselves the Israelites. And in the early period, in the time of Merneftach, Merneftach calls them the Israelites. So it's fairly clear that we have a group called Israel in the hills of Samaria from 13th century all the way down to the 8th century. Now, you'll ask, well, how does this fit in with the book of Joshua? It doesn't fit in with the narratives of the battles in Joshua, but it does fit in with the stories in Joshua 16, 17 about people settling the hill country of Manasseh, the hill country of Ephraim, about questions of who gets the better inheritances, about the inability to conquer the Canaanite cities located in the Valley of Jezreel, the necessity of settling in the hills. And so these are the Isra this is the clear archaeological evidence that we have for Israelite settlement in the time of Joshua. If we're looking for historical archaeological evidence, we find it in the hills of Samaria, and we look at how it corresponds to Joshua 16 and 17. Um, what do we know about uh, religion and cult uh, of early Israel Israelites? Okay, so this is a very, very important question, uh, and one which we uh, have very little inscriptional evidence from the early periods. In other words, uh, if I look for our, the 12th period of Joshua, I look for inscriptions, with the exception of possible section of this, uh, the recently discovered Mount Eval tablet, we have no clear evidence of inscriptions. That doesn't mean that we don't have evidence for religion. Uh, we have at several interesting sites discovered by Adam Zartal in the region around Samaria, what he called Gilgals. Now, I can discuss whether this is actually Gilgals, but they're very, very interesting archaeological sites, which are shaped in a kind of circular or oval pattern, where all around them are as a processional way, when people march in a procession, people would have marched, presumably, in a procession around the, the site. The site is located approximately uh, 1,000 or, two th or even 1,500 square meters large. And in the center is an enclosure, near which is an altar. And so we clearly understand that in the Samaria Hills in this period, Israelites, or perhaps other people, but most likely Israelites, practice some kind of religious activity which involved sacrifice on the one hand and on the other hand a procession around the region around the site and the establishment of some kind of structure in the site this is of course similar to the kind of descriptions we have in Joshua of Joshua gathering the people or in the book of Samuel of Samuel gathering the people at specific sites inveying them to uh, preserve their ancestral traditions uh, and keeping the laws of God, uh, we do have this idea of sacrifice. And some of these sites include the most famous Gilgal, which is near 
the Moshav called Argaman in the Jordan Valley. There's a site there called Beit Shaab, which is a very, very interesting site. There are several other sites in the Jordan Valley as well. There's a very interesting site which made the news recently on Mount Eval, or Ebal, near Shechem, which contains a, an altar dating from this period. Again, the sacrifice of animals is extremely important in the, in the ritual activity, and it comprises most of the evidence we have for Israelite religious activity. There's the sacrifice of animals, including sheep, goats, cow, very few cows, cows are very expensive, but mostly sheep and goats, uh, sometimes fallow deer, uh, and the, the sacrificial meal, uh, which the, the borderline between sacrifice and a family meal is very unclear. Uh, what, makes a, what makes a family meal into a sacrifice? The fact that blood is sp spilled on the altar, sprinkled on the altar, so we have the altars there. Uh, that, and what, what's most interesting about the Israelites in terms of their uniqueness is not necessarily the sacrifices that they practice, but the political organization. The Israelites distance themselves from the Canaanite political organization in a very, very clear way. Canaanites had their um, religion and politics organized around city-states. In the city-state of Shechem, which is the largest city-state in the northern part of the land, of northern hill country of Israel, we find from the Middle Bronze and on, temples and altars in Shechem. The Israelites arrive late 13th, early 12th century. There is no connection between them and the city of Shechem. They settle in areas that are not proximate to Shechem, and the Israelite altars are established outside the city. Not in the city, but outside the city. The Israelite altars are not part of the city-state. The Israelite settlement pattern does not correspond to the settlement pattern around the city of Shechem. Uh, there is no central place. And Shechem, in fact, in the RN1, falls into um, disrepair. The city of Shechem is, is abandoned for much of the RN1, according to the recent excavations by, uh, according to the recently published excavations by Wright. He did the excavations in the 60s, but they were only published in the last uh, 15 years. And so we know that whatever the Israelites are doing in the city, in the hills of Samaria, it is not connected to Canaanite uh, religion and not to Canaanite political structures. Um, okay, uh, could you possibly tell us how can we uh, differentiate, uh, archaeologically speaking, between Canaanite and Israelite sites? It's a very, very important question. So one of the clear distinctions uh, is the time periods. And we just discussed how Shechem is abandoned in the Iron One, and that's a very important uh, point because Shechem is the center of Canaanite politics and religion in the Samarian Hill Country in the uh, period of the Iron One between the 13th, uh, or the late 13th and the uh, late 11th centuries. The Distinctions between Israelites and Canaanites are the subject of a lot of scholarly discussion, as you probably are aware. Uh, it's very interesting that, of course, Canaanites and Israelites use the same vessels. Right? They eat the same foods in many ways. But there are important distinctions. While they use the same vessels, they use only some of the same vessels. Canaanites and Israelites use similarly shaped pottery because that's the standard pottery of Canaan. However, in the hill country sites, which I spoke about, the hill sites in the hill country of Samaria, which, because, which we know are Israelite in the later period, the 10th century, 9th century, 8th century, no one questions that they're Israelite. And as I mentioned, in 12th century, it appears that, or in 13th, late 13th century, it appears that Merneftach is calling them Israelites. So we can call them Israelites. In those sites, uh, only a part of the Canaanite ceramic repertoire are used, is used. In other words, there's a vast, 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 vast number of types of pottery dishes that Canaanites use. Canaanites use uh, imported pottery and locally produced pottery. Israelites, in contrast, only use locally produced pottery. Canaanites use decorated and undecorated pottery. Israelites use only undecorated pottery. There is a tendency to focus among the Israelites on the simpler pottery types. And that, of course, may be due to poverty. But then we move into Iron II, into the period after the 10th century, and the Israelites are no longer an impoverished society. And yet they continue to use the same 
types, the um, undecorated pottery and the non-imported pottery. This already suggests that it's a conscious decision to eschew and avoid the expensive pottery types and focus on the simpler and cheaper types. Uh, there's a very interesting discussion of this in Avi Faust's book called Israel's Ethnogenesis, which I encourage everyone to look at. It's a dense book, but it's an interesting one. Uh, there's a very clear tendency among the Israelites to avoid the, the expensive pottery types. Second of all, the very famous question of the pig bones, right? Canaanites and Israelites both rarely eat pig. Pig bones are a very small quantity of the repertoire of animal bones in both types of sites. However, among the Canaanites, that small number can reach up to five or even seven percent. Among the Israelites, it's always less than uh, a tenth of a percent. So the small number is very different in the two groups. Among the, again, among the Israelites, it's a very, very small number. It's less than a tenth of a percent. And this suggests a much stronger taboo against uh, pigs among the Israelites and a much, much stronger avoidance. Canaanites may have avoided it because it wasn't so practical to go to get pigs. Israelites avoid it because there's a very strong decision to avoid it. Let's move on to other questions. Both Canaanites and, Israel, and Israelites live in the type of house known as the four-room house. However, Canaanites also use other types of houses. Israelites only use the four-room house. To the extent that among the Israelites, even when they build large public buildings, they build them in the form of four-room houses. Right? All of, in every Israelite site, we will find almost exclusively four-room houses and not any other type of house, even if they're very large buildings. It's, four, it's built as a four-room house. What is a four-room house? A four-room house essentially is a type of building where you enter, again, you can look in Faust's book for a longer description, but you enter the uh, house through, uh, into a courtyard. Around the courtyard are th usually three other rooms, sometimes two, sometimes four, but usually three other rooms. Those are the rooms that served as the family living area. The courtyard serves as the cooking area and gathering area. Uh, and that type of, and, and from every, from the courtyard, there is access to every other room. There's no room that, ha that you have to go through another room in order to get to it from the courtyard. And so that's the standard type of house in all the Israelite settlements of the Iron One. So we see here a series of distinctions between Israelites and Canaanites, which may have a certain ideological connection between them. We mentioned before that the Canaanites are organized in city-states with a king. The Israelites are in small settlements at this point in the Iron One, 12th to 10th centuries without a king, 12th to 11th centuries without a king. Now, the eschewing of expensive pottery types may be also part of an egalitarian ethos, where they avoided um, Social distinction, social distinction markers or social stratification markers by all using the same kind of simple pottery. Similarly, the four-room house. Everyone can access every room from the courtyard. There are larger four-room houses, there are smaller four-room houses, but everyone can access every room from the courtyard. There's a variety of markers which seem to suggest that Israelite society was based on a kinship model where people saw themselves as part of a, of a family. There was not a strat political stratification of king versus those who were ruled. Uh, and there were certain ways in which the Israelites intentionally distinguished themselves from the Canaanite neighbors. Um, thank you very much. Yes, I, I, I do know also that the Bible itself has an anti-monarchical bent, if one can... Uh, right, there's, there's, there's clearly an anti-monarchic bent, but that anti-monarchic bent expresses itself politically in the fact that the Israelites, for the first 200 years of their presence in Canaan, do not seem to establish uh, a monarchy and do not seem to inhabit uh, the classical uh, royal cities, the classical ci the cities which were usually associated with the city-state model in Canaan, like Shechem, like Megiddo, like Chatzor. They are very, very, uh, in some cases, the Israelites, uh, those cities are abandoned, like Shechem. In other cases, like Megiddo, they continue under Egyptian rule. And in the case of Chatzor, there is a very, very small settlement there in the, in the 12th and 11th centuries, uh, which may or may not have been Israelite, but we really find it it's really quite clear that there are no Israelite city-states established in Canaan, which is very interesting because it comes after a period of several hundred years of Canaanite city-states. The Israelites come in, 
where the Canaanites remain, there are city-states, there's a connection to Egypt, the Philistines are around, but where the Israelites are, there's no city-states. Um, I wanted to, uh, to ask you, you've mentioned several uh, surrounding cultures, you know, Egypt, uh, Philistines. Could you possibly tell us a little bit more about them? And did, do, do they have any records left about Israel, as you've mentioned, obviously, Merenptah, but anyone else? Okay, so the, the short answer is that there is no text which mentions Israel outside the Bible from the time of Merneftah down through uh, the 9th century where we get to Mesha of Moab. Uh, the picture is a little bit more complicated. The Egyptians, of course, are the dominant uh, rulers of Canaan from at least the beginning of the Middle Bronze uh, uh, 2000 down till the uh, period of approximately 1100 BCE. So for, for nearly a thousand years, a little bit less, the Egyptians are the rulers of Canaan, and they do this by uh, forming alliances with the Canaanite city-states. Uh, the Egyptian religion was, of course, a complex one with many, many different gods, uh, but its political structure was one in which the different rulers of Egypt who call themselves the pharaohs, contracted with the Canaanite kings who ruled in different places of Canaan to allow the Egyptians uh, ownership of Canaan in return for recognizing the uh, Canaanite kings as local potentates. So the Egyptians and the Canaanites sort of cooperate. As we know, around 1150 BCE, the Canaanite uh, political structure is interrupted when the Philistines arrive. And there's a lot of discussion of what, what were the relationships between the, Israel, between the uh, Egyptians and the Philistines. But it seems clear today that the Egyptians, to a certain extent, allowed the Philistines to establish themselves in Canaan. The Egyptians um, let the Philistines take over the south uh, west of the country, the region between Gaza and Jaffa, or Gaza and Ashdod, uh, and inland towards uh, Gath and Ekron. These areas came under the sway of the Philistines. Uh, there were not necessarily competitions between the Philistines and the Egyptians. The Egyptians allowed this to happen because the Philistines were part of a larger group called the Sea Peoples. The Sea Peoples settle in different places in Canaan and in Syria. They settle in northern Syria. They settle in southern, southwestern Canaan. Where they don't settle, interestingly, is in what we call Phoenicia. Phoenicia is the land that's today Lebanon. That area was very, very important to the Egyptians. And it seems that the Egyptians cut some kind of deal with the Philistines. Settle in the areas that aren't so important to us, but keep Phoenicia alone. And so this, the Philistines settled in the southwest part of Canaan. They settled in Syria. Uh, they practiced a religion about which we know very little, but based on their, um, based on their later textual data, it seems to be related to their ancestral lands of Greece continuing the cults of, 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 that they brought with them. Uh, the Egyptians have their own cultic system, um, and the Israelites are the ones who have, from whom we have, of course, the very extensive textual record that we know as, of as the Bible. Um, we do know that the control of Egyptian uh, empire uh, weakened uh, at, yes. at this point. Did it affect the, well, the settlement of Israelites Very much Canaan. so. And it does it in several degrees. The Egyptian um, control of Canaan, the Egyptian uh, uh, political power, weakened in a grad very gradual way. First of all, by the 14th century, when we have the Amarna texts, the Amarna letters, we see that the Egyptian control is weakening, first of all, in the hill country. The main area of the Apiru, the opponents of the Egyptians in the 14th century, are in the hill country around, around Shechem, and the Egyptians gradually begin to realize that this area around Shechem is just trouble for them. There's very little wealth to be accessed there. There are a lot of opponents. And the Egyptians, by the 13th century, make a decision that they're not going to try to control Shechem. Uh, they establish, 13th, 12th centuries, they establish governor's residencies in different parts of Canaan. No governor's residencies are established in the hill country around Shechem. So that area becomes sort of clean of Egyptians, empty of Egyptians, right? If we could say in German, 
Egypten Gain, but it doesn't sound very good. Uh, the area, that area is empty of, uh, of, of Egyptians. It, therefore, in the late 13th century, when the Israelites are looking for where to settle, they settle in the area around Shechem, or, or north of Shechem, uh, in the Samarian hill country, where uh, the Egyptians had vacated. The Canaanite potentates have become weakened because the Egyptians are not supporting them anymore, and so the Israelites take advantage of that and settle in that area. In contrast, other areas of Canaan are taken over by the Philistines. We mentioned the Southwest, which in the 12th, cent in the 12th century, around 1150, falls to the Philistines. If we move farther north to the Jezreel Valley, which is, of course, the richest agricultural area of the land of Israel, that area remains at least nominally under Egyptian control until sometime early in the 11th century. And so the Israelites do not take over the Jezreel Valley. The Jezreel Valley remains Canaanite. And the book of Joshua tells us that, and the book of Judges tells us that. The initial chapters of Judges tell us that. The um, Joshua 16 and 17 mention that. The Jezreel Valley is not settled by the Israelites. Only at a later stage, when we get to Iron II, 10th century, then does Israel enter the um, Jezreel Valley. So essentially, if I want to summarize in a nutshell, the, Israel, the Egyptians gradually vacate the land, and the Israelites gradually settle the areas that the Egyptians vacated. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have discussed uh, the fact that there isn't much uh, archaeological evidence for the, uh, for the events described during, in the Bible for the destruction of Canaanite cities by Israelites. Um, we know that there are, at least I know that there are other theories. One is the gradual settlement theory and the second one is the internal process theory. Could you possibly tell our viewers a little right. bit so about So what I've been advancing here is the th theory that's generally known as the gradual settlement theory, which was first articulated by Alt and later elaborated by R. Roney and I think has gained wide acceptance, not, in, not, not completely, but has gained a, a very great deal of acceptance which is that there was a gradual process of Israelite settlement. And I think that, that the archaeological evidence supports that very clearly. Um, Albright had attempted to argue, based on the conquest of Hazor, that, the Israelite, that there's evidence for the book of Joshua. Albright ignored the fact that this idea of Joshua marching, along, marching around and conquering all the land of Israel, destroying all the cities, is contradicted by indications within the book of Joshua and in the book of Judges, book Joshua 13. Much of the land remains unconquered. Judges chapter 1 th describes a conquest by tribe. So there, there's not necessarily a lot of biblical evidence for the biblical material that Albert was trying to find the archaeological evidence for. Uh, so we have, a, we, have a, we have a problem there. Again, Chatzor remains the single clear piece of evidence of a, Canaan, of a very, very major Canaanite city-state destroyed in the 13th century. Yadin, who excavated Chatzor, argued that that's clearly the Israelites' destruction. Later scholars have questioned that, but no one can prove that the Israelites did or didn't conquer Chatzor. Again, I think Chatzor's destruction fits into the gradual process theory. A separate, or uh, gradual settlement theory. Uh, a separate view, group of scholars uh, argued for this being an internal process. They argued that all of the Canaanites, all of the settlements found in the Samaritan hill country, in the hill country north of Shechem, uh, in the 13th and 12th century, are Canaanites who abandoned their towns and moved into the, the, the hill country. That's a very, very interesting point of view. And it requires us to accept that these Canaanites who moved into the Samaritan hill country underwent a very, very substantial and deep-seated political and ideological change. As they moved into the Samaritan hill country, they abandoned many pottery forms. As I spoke about the pottery form, there's, there's differences in the ceramic repertoire. They also abandoned certain foodways. They also abandoned certain building practices. Furthermore, they abandoned their political structures. They didn't establish city-states. So I would ask at this point, in what way are those people who settled, who were Canaanites, who then settled in the Samaritan Hill Country, in what way are they still Canaanites? Their ancestors perhaps may have been Canaanites, but they are not living the classical lifestyle of the Canaanite. And so I think that when we speak about internal processes, uh, we have to be clear on the idea 
that the settlements of the Iron One, 12th, 11th centuries in the Samaritan Hill Country don't look like typical Canaanite settlements because the people there are living in a way that's very different from the way the Canaanites lived through the previous centuries and from the ways that Canaanites are living in the 12th and 11th centuries in areas like the Jezreel Valley uh, and the southern Shvela. So really it's very hard to speak about these people being Canaanites. Their ancestors might have been Canaanites. Their ancestors more likely were a combination of Canaanites and Israelites who came into the country, settled in the country. It's very hard to imagine that there was no degree at all of intermarriage between the groups. In all probability, some Canaanites and some Israelites intermarried. This is already hinted at in the book of Ezekiel when he speaks about the ancestors of Israelites being Canaanites. Uh, there are clear, or Amorites or Hittites. Uh, clearly, there are, is some degree of intermarriage among the groups. Uh, but this group, the group that emerges in the Samaritan Hill Country in 12th, 11th centuries, becomes a very distinct group who, uh, if they saw themselves as Canaanites, didn't express it in any meaningful way in the material culture. Um, could you possibly tell us, uh, well, you said that there isn't much biblical evidence for the biblical story itself of the destruction of the land of Canaan. Look, the destruction of the land of Canaan is a wonderful story to tell kids if you're looking at a, well, if you want your like five page summary of the book of Joshua and like a big dramatic story, so Joshua watched it on Jericho, yay, 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 he conquers. But again, the book of Joshua says that he doesn't con that there's parts of the land that he doesn't conquer, and the, those parts of the land are very much. Right? There's a lot left to, to conquer. Joshua doesn't conquer everything. Uh, so we have to be, keep that in mind when we try to sort of find evidence for Joshua destroying the land of uh, the Canaanites, that the biblical text itself says that Joshua didn't do a very good job of destroying the Canaanites. Uh, this is what I want to ask you. Why does it tell us about the destruction of the land of Canaanites at all? And with that in mind, you could, could you possibly also tell our viewers about the Deuteronomistic history theory of the Bible? Okay, there's the two separate issues. Let's first about, speak about Joshua. Part of the idea of the book of Joshua is the creation of an Israelite identity. Uh, the Israelites are living in the land of Canaan. They are living, in many ways, among the Canaanites. There are certainly Canaanites in the Samaritan Hill Country who, rem who remained there throughout the period and who very gradually perhaps assimilated into Israelite civilization. Uh, but the Israelites themselves also may have wanted or may have thought or may have considered or may have been attracted to assimilate in into Canaanite civilization. Canaanite civilization is the largest uh, group within the land, and it's the group that's very deeply rooted in the history of the land. The book of Joshua is about the distinction, the growing distinction, and creating a distinction between the Israelites and Canaanites. The Israelites have to make decisions about their lifestyles, decisions which will distinguish between they and the, them and the Canaanites. And so the book of Joshua is about creating those distinctions. The book of Judges, even more so, is about creating the, those distinctions. For example, the Gideon story takes the question of Baal worship. Baal worship is a re regular feature of Canaanite life. Will the Israelites become Baal worshippers? Tune in next time when we read the book, uh, the, the story of Gideon. Uh, if you look at the book of Joshua, why is there this idea of destroying the Canaanites? Uh, it's a good question. I think part of the answer is that the Israelites have to distinguish themselves and separate themselves from the Canaanites. There is a certain degree of warfare going on, uh, but we do not find clear evidence for uh, the Israelites destroying all the Canaanite city-states. We find Chatzor destroyed 1250. We find Lachish or Lachish destroyed around 1100 BCE. Uh, did the Israelites do both, either or both of those destructions? It's very hard to know. But Canaanite city-state culture does collapse in this period, and the Israelites gradually uh, emerged in certain areas in the Iron One, in the hill country, and only later in the 10th century do they go into the, into the valleys. The Deuteronomistic history theory propounded by Menot is the idea that the books of Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings were all edited by uh, an editor who sought to uh, align the texts of these books, or this narrative of these books, with what we find in, in the Torah book of Deuteronomy.
Now, that theory has gone through a variety of uh, iterations and developments over the 60 or so years, 70 or so years since Note initially, initially articulated it. My view is that yes, these books were edited by some editor who wanted to align these books with the book of Deuteronomy uh, sometime around the end of the First Temple period. But I would highlight the word edited and emphasize that this is a very light editing. Uh, many of the materials in the book of Kings clearly date to much earlier periods than the period of the destruction of the temple when the Deuteronomistic editor is supposed to have lived. There's no question that the, the um, texts of about Solomon, uh, the texts about Moab, the texts about Moab date to the 9th century, the texts of, text of Solomon may well date to the 10th century. These are much earlier than the period of the Deuteronomistic editor. Similarly, some of the material in Joshua is also much earlier. The city lists in Joshua 15, for example, are not all from the period of the Deuteronomistic editor. Uh, the uh, Judges chapter 1, which talks about the different tribe settling, reflects a reality of the late 11th century. Uh, so there are many, many, many materials in Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, which date from far earlier than the Deuteronomistic editing, and in some cases go back to the 11th century BCE. Uh, in other cases, 10th, 9th century. These books are composed in a gradual process in which only the very last editing of the books is done by the Deuteronomistic editor in the uh, late 6th century, close to the period of the destruction of the temple. And of course, the Book of Kings uh, is completed after the destruction of the temple and contains notices of events that transpired in the middle of the 6th century. So that, uh, this is, the, again, these books are gradual. Uh, there, is, there, are great, there are many, many earlier materials here. We have 11th century uh, materials. We have 10th century materials. We have 9th, 8th, 7th century materials. The final edit is the, uh, is the 6th century. Uh, but there is Deuteronomistic, uh, the Deuteronomistic editor uh, is not responsible for composing these books. He or she are responsible for the final edit. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, Professor Raster. Thank you. It's been a very educational and enjoyable interview. Thank you. Uh, I would also like to thank the uh, bar -Ilan University School of Political Science and Dr. David Leitner for enabling us to create this project. And I would also like to take this opportunity to direct our viewers to the uh, YouTube channel of the Department of Land of Israel Studies and Archaeology, where Professor Aster, is, Professor Aster has several lectures recorded. They're very interesting. I would recommend watching them. Thank you very much for joining us today, and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.